today. Huh? Top tonight, the mother of a murdered teenager says she wants justice for the killer. Sandra Marie Hernandez disappeared two weeks ago today. Today, police told her mother, Rosalinda Hernandez, that they'd arrested a young man who's confessed to her murder. Reporter Chris Adams has been following this story, and he is joining us now live with the latest on it. Chris? Well, Dave and Melanie, this is where it all began to go so very wrong for the teenager. The family of her alleged killer lived here on this street. This is the house, in fact. This is also the last place she was known to have been seen alive. Tonight at the Hernandez home, the sense of grief is almost overwhelming. Today's news of an arrest and confession in the case brings at least some small comfort to the murdered girl's mother. I can rest easy. My daughter can rest easy now. 15-year-old Sandra Marie Hernandez disappeared June 22nd. She had been at a party here at a home shared by 17-year-old Marco Antonio Ramos. Last week, when I interviewed Ramos, this is what he had to say about her disappearance. Are you worried? Well, yeah, I don't know what happened to her. But police say Ramos knew a lot more. He has confessed to making sexual advances toward Hernandez, saying that when she rejected him, he beat and strangled her, tossing her body down a storm drain. Her corpse was recovered Monday. Ramos's confession has surprised neighbors who know him. Was he violent? Did he show violent tendencies? Mm -hmm. Like I said, he was just like your average, everyday kid. That's what's so weird about it. Now I realize that you are gone. And without my best friend, it's hard to go on. So while the murdered girl's friend writes poetry to try and heal her heart, Sandra Hernandez's mother cries and talks about justice. I just want him to try to the maximum, just death penalty, whatever. I want him to suffer like he made my daughter suffer. Marco Ramos is charged with murder. His bond is set at $100,000. Reporting live, Chris Adams, 13 Eyewitness News. Pleasantville residents held a second community meeting tonight to demand some answers. Mainly, they want to know what caused that huge seven-alarm warehouse fire back on June 24th, and if they or their families are at risk from the fallout. Reporter Stuart Stanley attended that meeting and joins us live now from the newsroom with more. Stuart? Dave and Melanie, the residents were calm at the start of this latest meeting, but as they realized many of their questions could not be answered yet, their attitudes changed. This meeting should have taken place 20 years ago. Emotions ran high at Holland Middle School tonight as the residents of Pleasantville searched for answers. They wanted to know who will pay their medical bills incurred after being treated for smoke inhalation from the warehouse fire. They also wanted to know the long-term effects of the chemical fallout from that fire. The answer they received is not comforting. Some become uh, reactive or, or toxic when, when heated or and when reacting with other chemicals and so it is hard to say you know there's no such there's not a yes no answer to it some of them just outright are, are a problem and some form intermediate pro byproducts that perhaps are toxic other questions here were more in line with day-to-day -day life can we eat from our garden it would be prudent not to eat anything taken from a garden uh, that was impacted by the emissions while little is known about what caused the fire one of the few comforting answers received concerns the cleanup operation the warehouse is now surrounded by a four-foot dike to keep rainwater from washing more chemicals into the neighborhood. The effects of the Houston Ship Channel have also been limited. Right now, about 98% of the, the uh, material that was down the channel has been picked up, and we don't see any uh, ongoing further contamination, so we're not really too concerned anymore with the channel. Houston Fire Department has raised its estimate of the dollar amount of equipment lost in that fire. One truck plus equipment, $530,000. Exactly who will pay and how much is an answer that will have to wait for another day. Now, EPA officials say that at least two more weeks are needed to find out exactly what kind of chemical compounds were formed within that fire. EPA crews will continue to do soil, air, and water testing in and around the neighborhood to monitor the possible dangers. Also, new legislation will probably come out of this fire that may change what kind of chemicals can be stored near a neighborhood. From the newsroom, Stuart Stanley, 13 Eyewitness News. Today's soggy weather was an inconvenience for a lot of us, but it was a blessing in disguise for firefighters and workers at a dry ice manufacturing company. Employees at the Carbonic Industries plant were transferring liquid ammonia from a delivery truck to tanks when a pipeline overpressurized. That tripped a safety release valve, sending ammonia fumes into the air. Two employees had to be evacuated briefly, but neither was hurt, and the rains kept the leak from spreading. No witnesses, no known motive. That's the situation Houston homicide detectives are dealing with tonight out on Chimney Rock in southwest Houston.
The bullet-riddled body of 21-year-old Roy Graco was found in the parking lot of the Hampton House apartments about 11.30 this morning. He had been shot repeatedly. Neighbors say they did hear gunfire, but no one saw the shooting, and police say they can find no motive for the murder. There's been a change of venue in a high-profile murder case. The capital murder trial of James Earl Mankins Jr. is being moved from Henderson to Beaumont due to extensive news coverage. Mankins is accused of the 1983 execution-style murders of five Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant employees in Kilgore. He's the son of former state representative James L. Mankins Sr., that is. More talk of a carpet fiber connection in the O.J. Simpson double murder trial today. FBI expert Douglas Dietrich took the stand again after the holiday break. He told jurors that carpet fibers in O.J. Simpson's Bronco were also found on the knit cap that was recovered at the crime scene and the bloody glove found at Simpson's estate. Prosecutors plan to wrap up their case this week by putting Nicole Simpson's mother, Judith Brown, on the stand. A media frenzy is already underway tonight in preparation for next Monday's trial of Susan Smith. Although cameras have been banned in the courtroom, officials in Union, South Carolina, expect hundreds of reporters from all over the nation to crowd into that small town. Smith captured headlines last October when she admitted drowning her two small sons by strapping them into their car seats and rolling the car into a nearby lake. Some strong accusations being made in the Oklahoma City bombing case tonight. Attorneys for suspect Timothy McVeigh were in court filing a motion against federal prosecutors. They're asking, the, accusing them of keeping witnesses from talking with the defense and leaking grand jury information. McVeigh is one of two suspects charged in the April 19th federal building bombing that killed 168 people and injured more than 500. The latest round of letters and manuscripts from the so-called Unabomber is yielding some new information tonight. Postal inspectors in San Francisco are closely studying those documents sent by the mysterious mail bomber to various media organizations and a professor in California. They're calling it a wealth of new information. They now say it's likely that he or she lives in the Bay Area. Actor Woody Harrelson's father tried to escape from a federal prison last night. 56-year-old Charles Harrelson is serving a life sentence for the 1979 murder of San Antonio federal judge John Wood Jr. Harrelson and two bank robbers used a makeshift rope to scale a wall at the U.S. prison in Atlanta, but they surrendered after a warning shot was fired from the guard tower. Well, what a rainy day. Texas' most experienced weathercaster, Ed Brandon, here to tell us what to expect in the morning. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock should be sunny. Temperature around 79 degrees. Looks like the heat is coming back. The weather in just a few minutes. Houston police get a new weapon to stop high-speed chases with saving lives in mind. From Doctors hope to save at least one of two Siamese twins born in Texas. Find out why Senator Jesse Helms says it's time to stop spending so much money on people with AIDS. And is actor Hugh Grant's life in jeopardy? Los Angeles police say yes. That's coming up in about four minutes. Stay with us. In this unit, we can continuously monitor the patient to determine the source of the seizure. Room 49, here we go. Doctor, it looks as if it's coming from the right temple. Continue your exercise. You need to keep up with those grandchildren. And how are you doing? I haven't felt this good in 10 years. Good. And you? Herman Physician Referral. We get to go home now. Oh, great. We can schedule surgery now. Now. When it comes to your health, Herman is so much more than a hospital. To anchor the fastest moving news program in Houston. They just made an arrest in the case. A news team must work right fast. Away. How about sending Vicente down to the DA's office? Think fast. I'm going to call the police department. And react oh, really fast. Story. We're going to have to change the lead. That's the way Melanie Lawson and Alan Hemberger work on Live at 5. And when you watch them, you'll see just why news travels faster on Channel 13. Live at 5 with Melanie Lawson and Alan Hemberger. Nobody covers Houston like 13 Eyewitness News. Performance. It's what we all want from our cars. But over time, deposits build up in a car's engine, which can ruin performance. Fortunately, there's Diamond Shamrock Advanced Gasoline. All three grades are specially formulated to clean entire intake systems and to minimize harmful combustion chamber deposits so you get the performance you want. Advanced Gasoline from Diamond Shamrock. Two suspected car thieves are behind bars tonight thanks to the quick actions of a brave Houstonian. Alan Bloxham says he was shopping at Hearst Yamaha in West Houston when he and the shop's owner noticed four suspects trying to steal a truck in the parking lot. When the truck's owner came out, the thieves took off in their own car. 
Well, that's when Bloxon got in his car and gave chase. Suspects didn't get more than about a block before they jumped out of the car and fled on foot. Bloxham chased one of the suspects down and held him there at gunpoint. I went around with one of the HPD officers into the apartment complex and I spotted him on the other side of the fence and uh, held him with my pistol until the HPD officer came up and uh, jumped the fence and put the cuffs on him. Another suspect was captured by police. The two teens, 16 and 18 years old, both faced charges of attempted theft and the other two suspects remain at large tonight. Houston police are hoping some new high-tech devices will put the brakes on high-speed chases. Police are studying an electronic device that actually chases and disables a fleeing car. The Road Patriot uses 100,000 volts to immobilize a car's electrical system. In the meantime, the police will be getting a new Stinger spike system. This device actually blows out tires, but officials say it's not as dangerous as you might think. Out of all the tests that we made, uh, there was no loss of control. The, the tires, unlike most people believe when you think of a spike system, it doesn't cause the tire to blow out. It caught, it's a uh, hollow spike that is released into the tire and causes a slow leak, which makes the tires go flat. Last year, 11 people died during high-speed police chases in Houston. Houston police are hoping these new devices will end injuries and deaths related to high-speed chases. If you ride a bicycle, you may need another piece of equipment soon. Houston City Council considering a measure that would require all bike riders under the age of 18 to wear a helmet. Councilmember Eleanor Tinsley is sponsoring the measure, but Councilman John Kelly says even though helmets are a good idea, they should not be enforced through a law. Council will vote on that measure next week. Florida Governor Lawton Child hospitalized tonight after suffering a mild stroke. 65-year-old Lawton temporarily had slurred speech, unsteady coordination, and weakness. Doctors say attacks like this require prompt attention because they can be a warning sign of a major stroke. They say they should know by tomorrow if Lawton is developing a full-blown stroke. He's listed in guarded condition. And the mother of Vice of President Al Gore remains hospitalized tonight after undergoing hospital. surgery for a stroke. Pauline Gore had a heart attack yesterday. She was listed in stable condition when she suffered the stroke today. The Vice President and his wife canceled their appearances and are in Nashville, Tennessee tonight, where his mother is being treated. North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms may find himself embroiled in a public bitter battle about some statements he made during an interview. The senator told the New York Times that he will spearhead an act to cut federal funding for AIDS patients. Helms told the newspaper that the reason people contract AIDS is because of their own, quote, deliberate, disgusting, and revolting conduct. Well, it didn't take very long for a response to Helms' statement. Jeannie White, whose son Ryan died of AIDS and for whom a federal grant is named, spoke out today. He's so homophobic. I, <laughs> um, this is not a homosexual disease. This is a people disease. And I think he has not ever learned that. And I think uh, education, I think, is going to be very hard. It's going to be very hard, I think, to educate Jesse Helms on AIDS. Uh, White says she has tried to talk with Senator Helms several times about AIDS issues, and she says each time the senator tells her to call his office. Well, it seems like bad news just keeps coming for actor Hugh Grant. First, he was caught with a prostitute and arrested. Then his girlfriend left him. Now Los Angeles police are urging Grant to take an AIDS test. An LAPD spokesman says the accused prostitute known as Divine Brown has repeatedly refused to take mandatory AIDS tests. In addition to prostitution charges, he's now facing fines for failing to take those tests. Still ahead, Marvin shares a personal struggle that he's been dealing with over the past year. Also, who says you can drink milk if you're lactose intolerant? There's some new information tonight. And here again are tonight's winning lottery numbers. 3, 39, 2, 18, 28, 23. And the th pick three numbers, 9, 8, 5. Get it in here with a new GMC Sonoma 5 speed With 118 horses under the hood. Whoa, boy! Shining, a gentle breeze was blowing in the Hamptons, you know. Uh, we, we just get out there once or twice a year, but it really is, still is one of the great oases. In the Eligible world. bachelors next Jenny Jones. Day, uh, Top tonight, the mother of a murdered teenager says she wants justice for the killer. Sandra Marie Hernandez disappeared two weeks ago today. Today, police told her mother, Rosalinda Hernandez, that they'd arrested a young man who's confessed to her murder. Reporter Chris Adams has been following this story, and he is joining us now live with the latest on it. Chris? Well, Dave and Melanie, this is where it all began to go so very wrong for the teenager. The family of her alleged killer lived here on this street. This is the house, in fact. This is also the last place she was known to have been seen alive. Tonight at the Hernandez home, the sense of grief is almost overwhelming. 
Today's news of an arrest and confession in the case brings at least some small comfort to the murdered girl's mother. I can rest easy. My daughter can rest easy now. 15-year-old Sandra Marie Hernandez disappeared June 22nd. She had been at a party here at a home shared by 17-year-old Marco Antonio Ramos. Last week, when I interviewed Ramos, this is what he had to say about her disappearance. Are you worried? Well, yeah, I don't know what happened to her. But police say Ramos knew a lot more. He has confessed to making sexual advances toward Hernandez, saying that when she rejected him, he beat and strangled her, tossing her body down a storm drain. Her corpse was recovered Monday. Ramos's confession has surprised neighbors who know him. Was he violent? Did he show violent tendency? Mm -mm, like I said, he was just like your average, everyday kid. That's what's so weird about it. Now I realize that you are gone. And without my best friend, it's hard to go on. So while the murdered girl's friend writes poetry to try and heal her heart, Sandra Hernandez's mother cries and talks about justice. I just want him to try to the maximum, just death penalty, whatever. I want him to suffer like he made my daughter suffer. Marco Ramos is charged with murder. His bond is set at $100,000. Reporting live, Chris Adams, 13 Eyewitness News. Pleasantville residents held a second community meeting tonight to demand some answers. Mainly, they want to know what caused that huge seven-alarm warehouse fire back on June 24th and if they or their families are at risk from the fallout. Reporter Stuart Stanley attended that meeting and joins us live now from the newsroom with more. Stuart? Dave and Melanie, the residents were calm at the start of this latest meeting, but as they realized many of their questions could not be answered yet, their attitudes changed. This meeting should have taken place 20 years ago. Emotions ran high at Holland Middle School tonight.